Hello, sir. Hello. <laughs> Greetings and welcome to the show. It's fantastic to have you on, uh, Nicholas. Um, it's a you honour us with your presence. Uh, <laughs> we've got well, we've got here. We've got five hundred people um, in 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 the chat, all eager to ask you questions, and who are thrilled to have you um, with us on the stream. I'm just going to try and add um, Susan and Lee back into the call as well, um, okay. and and Pete. So if you just give me a a, a second, um, you want me to uh, hum? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you give us give us a little mm -hmm. give us a little tune. Oh dear, I'm try trying to add everyone. It's not working. Ah, uh, where am I? There we go. There's Pete. Um, so um, you you your your big Finnish characters are finally in the game of Doctor Who um, Legacy. Are you are you a fan of the game? Have you been playing it? Have you been following the uh, uh, their, their addition to the call? You're asking me. <laughs> yes, I am asking you. I am asking you. Sorry. Um, uh, I I know of it, but I have yet. Yeah. Have the, what's going on? I can hear lots of rustling around. <laughs> oh yeah, you know that that that's Pete. That's what that's what happens when Pete comes on. I'm afraid we uh, talk about it yeah, many sorry. many many times. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just know of it, and I haven't had a chance to look at it. I'm going to look at it in the next couple of days, actually. But I hear it's. I mean, people I know are massively enthusiastic about it, and that it's some um, one of the strongest points about it is that it's really dramatic and immersive, and people get kind of drawn into it and can't leave it alone it's a it's very very cool it's a match a match three gem games and it's got some of your 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 your, your big finish uh characters on there now which is coming out in a couple of days i think or the or the advert i'm just trying to get susan back in i'm sure she will uh she'll, she'll tell us so what what is obviously you you are like the the quintessential hoovian as you seem to be involved in kind of absolutely everything so would you mind kind of running us through a few of the kind of roles that you have Yes. Uh, well, um, I'm the voice of the Daleks and several other monsters on the TV series. Um, and I'm the executive producer of Big Finish Productions, uh, co-executive mm -hmm. producer with uh, Jason Hay Gallery, who, who's the chairman of the company. But I sort of have um, operational and creative responsibility for everything. And Big Finish Productions have a license from the BBC to do uh, what we would call classic Doctor Who audio adventures, you know, covering the first eight Doctors up until and including Paul McGann as the Eighth Doctor. And, of course, one of the, the, the characters who's coming to Legacy is Charlotte Pollard, who was our first Eighth Doctor Adventures uh, Doctor Who companion. So, uh, and who's, you know, an Edwardian adventurous born in 1912, uh, meant to have died on the R101 airship disaster, but she's snatched from that disaster by the Eighth Doctor. But yeah, those are my roles. What else do I do? Do I do anything else? <laughs> no, I think, isn't that enough? <laughs> that's quite a bit, I yeah. think that's a, I, that is, that is a absolutely uh, huge, huge um, 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 amount. <laughs> I'm living the dream. Um, I'm living the dream. Uh, Nick, you do, you do write a lot of the adventures as well, that big finish. Oh, I do, project. yes. I write and direct and have done a lot of sound design for Big Finish, but um, that's quite time consuming. So with my executive producer role, that's quite difficult to fit that in. But I still do manage to do uh, music for some of the episodes as well. So um, I'm, I'm wrapped up in it. Oh, I, I love to write as well. I'm writing the second series because Charlotte Pollard, we, we've spun her off into her own adventures without the Doctor as well. And there's already uh, a series one box set out and i'm writing the the second series uh now i would say as we speak i mean it is actually on my screen i could actually start writing it now. <laughs> continue writing it um, i think i'm just about at the end of episode one so yeah lot, lots of writing lots of directing i was directing tom baker on um well, when was that yesterday i'm working with colin baker today acting alongside him so uh, you know as i say i say it frivolously but i am living the dream i'm having the most Marvellous time. I feel so lucky. Uh, it's my favourite thing ever, Doctor Who. What can I say? And I, and I do it every, <laughs> every day of the week. So what was your very first... I was going to say, what was your very first involvement in Doctor Who then? That's so much. Where, where did it all start? Well, it started... I mean, I can't remember a time when I wasn't into the show. I was, you know, I'm, I was born in 1961, so I was born before the series started, but I was, I don't remember the show not being on. I just, I remember <laughs> William Hartnell as the Doctor, you know. Um, uh, so when did I first get involved in, I don't know what, doing something career-wise? Mm. 
I used to do um, for a company called Real Time Pictures, Pictures, and I'm still involved with that, doing uh, I- interviews on video with Doctor Who personalities. And I started doing that back, back in 1983 or four, something like that. My first interview was with the late, great Nick Courtney, who, of course, played the Brigadier. Um, and, you know, he became a firm friend after that. So, yeah, I was involved doing that, and it wasn't until 1999 that we got the license from uh, the BBC to do uh, the Doctor Who audio plays. We've just celebrated our 15th anniversary for Doctor Who. Um, so, yes. Thank you, thank you. I think I also wrote a, a comic strip for Doctor Who magazine once. I used to write, I think I wrote reviews of things for Doctor Who magazine, wrote interviews, hmm. so very involved there, really. I mean, you know, once you get into that Doctor Who world, you meet lots of other people who love Doctor Who and who are doing various things, and opportunities, thankfully, presented themselves, you know. It's, you know, you did, you you know did, for, for us on the legacy uh, side. Uh, go on, go on, sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Well, I was just going to say, everyone in the, uh, the the chat must be absolutely drooling right now. They at your are. Life, There's you know? a lot of that. Yeah. I don't know if you're watching the text. Maybe Sounds a bit disturbing. Of fangirling, drooling. That's, that's the, uh, true, true. <laughs> 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 but I was going to say, you know, we, uh, Lee and I uh, have, have and, and, and I don't know if you know that Lee is sick. So that's about the only thing that can be keeping him from this, this dialogue today is the fact that he's got a terrible stomach flu. Oh. Um, so he's listening. He's not speaking, which is probably... Okay which is probably one less voice in the channel. Um, (laughs) But I was going to say that, you know, what we've learned in just the last, you know, what is it, year and a half that we've been, you know, intimately involved with the brand as opposed to just viewers, that it's just just tremendous people to work with. Of course, Peter, you know, which I have to say that about the channel, but everyone we've dealt with at the BBC and uh, the brand have just been so so obsessed with their own property. Like we like to say that as much as we love Doctor Who, and like now we're dealing with people who know and love it even more than, than, than we do, which we didn't know was possible. So it's been a really fun experience. I can only imagine what 15 years have been like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a way of life for me and a really good way of life. And it's, it's just got better and better. You know, and it's right what you say about people, actually. Uh, I mean, you know, we talk a lot to Matt Nichols of the BBC, mm. who's, who's lovely. Uh, and who I've known since the beginning of the the new series of Doctor Who on television, you know, back with Chris Eccleston when he was working uh, on the brand team then. And, you know, one of the best things for me about it all is that the team I have at Big Finish, you know, a fantastic line producer, David Richardson, and, uh, well, I won't just name names, but, uh, you know, lovely people, and it is all about us working together on our favorite thing. I mean, a big finish, we also do things other than Doctor Who. You know, I'm involved in playing Sherlock Holmes. Um, mm, yeah, we saw the, saw the pictures earlier. Yeah. And, uh, and you've been... And right. Good Omens. Good right. Omens. It's like my husband, Lee and I, it's our favorite oh. book of all time, I think, is Good Omens. But do you know, I, it's sacrilegious though it is. I don't know the book. I mean, I know... Really? <laughs> you have to read it. It's really, it's really my, good. My friend Dirk Mags, <laughs> Uh, got the job of uh, directing that for Radio 4. Uh, Dirk and I have known each other uh, for quite a few years since before Big Finish got the Doctor Who license, actually, because bizarrely we spoke about doing um, Dan Dare audios. Do you know Dan Dare, the comics character from the Eagle comic? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the pilot. Yeah, very British sort of, you know... Uh, hey, uh, in his mouth, <laughs> and, you know, let's, let's get the, those damn Martians sort of thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, shoot first, and ask questions later. He was a bit like that, wasn't he? Um, but we were going to do that, and that never happens. But we've kept in touch, you know, all these years, and hopefully Dirt will come and do something for Big Finish soon. But, yeah, he, you know, at some point relatively recently, I said, by the way, you can always give me a job if you want, Dirk. <laughs> <laughs> and then Good Omens came up and he needed someone to play uh, Metatron, you know, the voice of God. And he uh, uh, he thought of me, bizarrely. And so I had the most fabulous time with him. Great cast. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and a great author as well. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we don't, we've had loads of questions about the, you know, the way you do your voices and 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 think and things like that. Now, I was looking at your kind of your resume, and it, obviously, you seem to do a lot of kind of sound creation and music comp- composition and things like that as well. I mean, are you involved in the the kind of the the tweaking of the voices, the effects of the voices, or are you just the voice actor that goes with it, or or you know, or, you know how, how far does your role go in terms of that? Well, I think it's quite unique in terms of the Daleks. Because when the series came back in 2005, and you know, we were filming it in 2004, 
one of the reasons Russell T. Davis asked me to do it was because he saw me, as he says, as a total solution. Because he knew, <laughs> he'd heard me do the voice. The complete back. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Problem solved. And when you're producing Doctor Who for the first time, goodness knows how many years, you want to solve as many problems as possible in one go. And, uh, you know, there was no radiophonic workshop. You know the radiophonic workshop used to work yeah. special yeah, sounds yeah, for yeah. Doctor mm-hmm. Who in the old days? None of that was there. So... He'd seen I'd written uh, articles in Doctor Who magazine going on about how the Dalek effect was done and photographs of me with a ring modulator and a microphone. Um, so, <laughs> and he'd heard me do the voices because he was a fan of Big Finish. He, you know, he's, I think he was a subscriber to our range, you know, so he'd heard <laughs> me do the Dalek voice. So he thought he, he can do it and he's got the means to do it. So I was very much bringing my technical ability and my acting ability, and the actual technical means, physically, you know, the the box that does it, to the set of the new Doctor Who. And so I had quite a lot of say into how how it was set up, which is a bit alien to the the sound recorders on the set. No pun intended. Hmm? (laughs) No 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 pun pun intended. intended, (laughs) Very alien. Um, so, uh, so yes, I had a lot of say about the tweaking of it, and it was quite, it was quite a task. You know, what I tend to do now, because, I mean, part of recording the Dalek voice, and just press the stop button if I'm going into too much detail. No, 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 no please. It's to please. overload the recording, and to, to sort of, for want of a better phrase, to do a bad job of recording it. The signal you send into the ring modulator has to be a kind of, the kind of signal you'd get from a rock singer screaming at close quarters into a <laughs> microphone, that sort of analog yeah. distortion. And some sound recordists, thankfully not the current one, Diane, who I work with on the series, um, some sound recordists are averse to recording something like that. And no matter how much you tell them that that is what creates the best effect, they just won't do it. So what I, and so I was always reliant on going through their mixing desk into my ring modulator. What I do now is I take my own little mixing desk and I provide them with a fully affected sound. So they can't louse it up, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you do your uh, your your Dalek voice, your Simon voices, are you are you, you you mentioned kind of being on set? I mean, are, are you literally kind of there, and you know the actors are doing their thing over there, and you're yelling exterminate in their faces? You know, are, are you yeah, yeah. you know do you, you see my name at the end? I'm, t- I'm part of the cast. <laughs> I am. The- oh, well, of course, of course, but it, it's not it's not dubbed in later. No, you are there doing. It's, it's uh, certainly the Daleks are always done on set. Um, I do mm-hmm. do some post-production dubbing, but that's normally, in the case of the Daleks, that's normally because of plot tweaks. And Because as I say on many a, of an occasion, the uh, Daleks are very good for solving the kind of plot problems that come up in the edit when they think, oh, I don't know whether that's clear. The Daleks state the bleak and obvious the whole time. So yeah. you can just <laughs> pop a Dalek line in there going, we have now done this and this is happening, and no one bats an eyelid because the Daleks are always <laughs> saying really obvious things. There's no subtext with the Dalek. No, and no, no, it creates, most obvious people in the galaxy. Being on set with it creates a lovely um, atmosphere. You know, everyone reacts to that voice, you know, crackling out of the speakers. The Cybermen, I, I did used to do those on set, but I think quite wisely we do those in post-production now because the Cybermen, you know, are fantastic, uh, but they, mm. they don't have an iconic voice. But throughout the series, the old series, the Cybermen voice, all, virtually every story changed. So nothing, if you ask people about the Cybermen, they talk about them being creepy and imposing and silver. They don't do a voice. Whereas if you ask people about the Daleks, yeah. they'll immediately go, exterminate. I mean, everyone's got a Dalek inside them, <laughs> haven't they? <laughs> and when you, when you do, obviously you've got your lovely little modulator, and I think I've seen a clip of you doing it. Um, you know, yes, you, on you there are plenty to... of clips of me at a re- Oh yeah, but you you probably have to act it, don't you? You know, you, it's not just a case of you talking into yes. the into thing and then it kind of turns you into Dalek. You're screaming into That's that thing. That's right. <laughs> well, as uh, David Tennant came and had a go with it on one of the, the studio ah. sessions we were doing, and he said, and he was kind of like many people who've tried to do it. They kind of oh, he said, God, you have to do some serious hectoring, don't you? You know, you can't just, as you say, I think some people imagine that it's like an acting box. So you get it and just go exterminate, and then it <laughs> screams at the other end. And, but you have to do all the screaming. It's the way I uh, think of it. It's like playing a really appalling, discordant, unpleasant musical instrument. You know, yes. Without it, it doesn't sound quite right. Like if you play, try and play a, a trumpet without a trumpet, you sound like this. 
So that's no good. The trumpet <laughs> to be lit to make that noise, you know. Um, and likewise with the Dalek. I can do a Dalek without the ring modulator. It doesn't quite sound right, but you know, the ring modulation without that performance is not doesn't it doesn't quite come together. Yes. I'm trying to Absolutely. justify my employment. I have, to tell you, I have to tell you a great story, which I, I really shouldn't, which is um, when I was in a London cab on the way to Paddington Station to go to Cardiff to film Doctor Who, inevitably the, the subject of what I was going to do in Cardiff came up, and I couldn't quite resist telling the chat over the, over the voice of the Daleks. She said, oh, yeah, that's, that's, oh, that's great. He said, um, do you have a sort of thing you talk through that kind of does the effect? And I said, to, well, yes. And he said, well, I'm not being funny, but I mean, couldn't anyone do that? And I went, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not true. I obviously do it in an entirely individual, inimitable way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so Pete, you've you've been uh, you're you're a big fan of of, of Nicholas's uh, 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 big Finnish productions, and one of the questions we had on Twitter was if, and obviously Nick, Nick, this is to you as well. Like, if people haven't listened to the big Finnish productions before, where where would be a good place for them to start? Oh, crikey! You know what? My favourite <laughs> is still Spare Parts. What do you like about spare parts? That's a story about the genesis of the Cybermen, basically. Yeah, it's just it's just brilliant. It's it's really really good. It's uh, it's a Peter Davidson Doctor. It's I, I don't want to spoil it. It's just it's moving. It's incredible. It's scary, and uh, you know you'll be glued to your MP3 player. Or, or CD player, and if you still have a CD player, um, what are those? Just, it's just brilliant. It's it's great. It's a great story, uh, and at the end of it, you want it to carry on. That and that that for me is a great story. If if you want it to carry on at the end, you don't want it to stop. And uh, you know, when you read a great book, you kind of get to that point where you know you're reading it and you're reading it and then you really want to know what happens but you know the book's going to end and it's like oh do i slow down or do i just plow on and and spare parts does it for me it's great um sephiron nine in the chat agrees with you says spare parts is an excellent one goes to really dark places that even the show itself um hasn't explored um, Nick, how much do you enjoy the process of of writing the, the the you know within the Doctor Who canon? Is it is it challenging? Is it fun? Is it a mix? I mean, how do, how do you uh, t- tell us about your kind of th- your thought process when writing a Doctor Who story? Uh, well, it varies for every Doctor Who story. I really love doing it. I wouldn't do it if I didn't. Like, I'd be mad to do it if I hated <laughs> it, wouldn't I? Um, you know, sometimes it comes with uh, the Doctor and the companion, and you think, well, what would I like to do with that particular? Uh, a team or sometimes it comes from the monster we've decided to have or sometimes I will have a, a particular idea about quite often something um, that is mirrored in nature for, and then, then the story goes off in a completely different way for example there was a, a Paul McGann an eighth doctor story we did called embrace the darkness and but the, the which was set uh, on a planet where there was no light whatsoever um, mm-hmm. and um, and all sorts of ghastly things happen. Uh, but my starting point on that idea was I was looking at moths and the way they were drawn to light. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if there were aliens who were drawn to a particular planet because of the light on it? And so in order for the people uh, on the planet to avoid having these, as it turned out, hostile aliens being drawn to them, they would find a way of eliminating all light in their planetary system. And you see what I mean? It's just the whole idea of the moth suddenly became the story idea, and then it changed beyond, you know, all proportion. It changed completely, but it's often the germ of an idea like that. I'm quite Mm. interested in ecological things, you know, thoughts about how people are destroying the environment, that kind of thing, and then extrapolating that to maybe an alien civilization. Or sometimes I think, wouldn't it be lovely if I took that favourite film of mine that's in fact not a Doctor Who or, or science fiction idea, and see how that would play in a Doctor Who universe. You know? That must be so much yeah, fun. And, it's fun. and of course, the moment you start to do it, it becomes unrecognisable. It's your starting point. It's the germ of an idea, you know. But then I spoil it all by, in the writer's notes in the CD, mentioning that that's the inspiration. <laughs> I blow my own cover. But, you know, 
I, I mean, I, I'm a great believer in, in that you can tell the same story an infinite number of ways and make it unrecognizable every time, you know. I mean, and people, some people argue, and certainly the further away you get from Doctor Who, I mean, we're very close to it because we love it, you know, all of us here. We, we scrutinize it and we're close to it. But the further, if you become a person who's not particularly interested in Doctor Who, do, all of Doctor Who starts to look the same the further away you are from it. We don't see that. We're scrutinizing every little bit of it. So it's interesting how, you know, in many ways, people who are not into Doctor Who would describe every Doctor Who story as being more or less the same, you know? But once you're in there, it's, you see the huge amount yeah. of, you see how wrong they you are. You know what, this is, it's just like, you know, if you're not into war movies or cowboy movies or, or soap operas or ghost stories, you could say, well, they're all the same, aren't they? There's always a ghost or there's always a pub or there's always a cowboy with a gun. You know, you could say that. And it's the interesting thing is to find the differences in, in the stories. Anyway, that's uh, one of our here. one of our one of our viewers here asks, uh, and I'm sure you've been asked this before, but I think it's a great question. Uh, do which is your favourite Dalek story or stories? And crucially, are you in it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big one for favourites, but you know I don't want to spoil the fun. So uh, I had a big argument the other day on the Big Finish podcast uh, about uh, Evil of the Daleks. You know, I'm old old enough to remember watching it twice because it was the first Doctor <laughs> Who story to be repeated in its entirety, I believe. Um, and I remember watching it the second time as a young kid and thinking, I've seen this before, surely. Oh, goodness, it is that one, yeah. Um, so even though, as was argued by my script editor, Alan Barnes, it's perhaps not the most incredible storyline, certainly from my memories of it, and from the one remaining episode and the way it's, it's directed and has such a, a, a real buzz and style about the way it's done, I, I would say Evil of the Daleks. Uh, uh, okay. Lots of people will go, ah, oh, no, Power of the Daleks is obviously a better one. Um, story to work on, I have enjoyed them all. Um, I think, on balance, probably the first one because that was so special. It was the first time we... As in Dalek. Yeah, Dalek. We had a lot of troubles with... But but there again, you know, I really um, enjoyed working on the latest one, Into the Dalek, Ben Wheatley. Mm. I think it's the first time I've worked with a director who you could probably call a Doctor Who fan. I mean, I don't know whether he was oh. quite owning up to it, but he did say to me at one point, oh, I'd really like to remake Face of Evil. He said, I thought, well, you know too much, mate. You know, you're a Doctor <laughs> Who fan. Uh he was delightful to work with, by the way, because he's a big fan of the Radio 4 series. Have you ever heard of that? Radio so uh, Ben Wheatley was a big fan of the Radio 4 series Nebulous, starring Mark Gatiss uh, and uh, David Warner and Steve Coogan. Uh, and I, and I uh, directed and did the sound design and music for three series of that, you know, quite a few years <laughs> ago. And he was a huge fan of it. So to meet me, <laughs> who, you know, had directed and did the music. So, so he was quite a fan of my work, which was a lovely position okay, to cool. be in with the director, really. Was Rusty one of the more right. fun Daleks to, to, to voice? Sorry, say again? Was Rusty one of the more fun Daleks to voice over the years? Yeah, the no, they, and I, as I always say, they, they always throw in a challenge for me. You know? Although <laughs> I love doing the, for want of a nicer phrase, the bog standard Daleks. I love all that, you know, barking orders and I obey and exterminate and all that sort of stuff. But it's lovely, you know, when they put in a bit of variety like that. And, yeah, and Rusty was a, a really fun one to do. I mean... You know, I, I did I did something very new, I think, for Rusty, so much so that when they put it in the trailer for the series, people were absolutely convinced that it was Davros, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Davros as well. Do you ever have a like a feeling of kind of um pro uh like protectivity, if that's a word over the Daleks? So when you kind of read the script of like a good Dalek, you know, were, were you, was there any part of you that was like, oh no, the Daleks wouldn't do this? You know, this is this is not something a Dalek would say, or are you happy, to, or, 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 or are you happy to go along with it? Do you ever have a kind of like a, you know, a, you know, a Dalek wouldn't do this or say I've this? I've never said that. I mean, you know, here's the difference to, uh, between me on the audio series and me uh, on the TV series. To use the analogy of building a house, for the audio series, I'm the art architect and the project manager, and I have mm -hmm. something to do with every single aspect of it. And when push comes to shove, I can get my way if 
I'm not really that kind of a person. I like other people to flourish. But, you know, the deal is nine times out of ten, you'll get your way with me. There's just that one time in ten when I'll go, no, I really think that this is right and this is my job to make this decision. When I go onto the TV series, I'm there to fix the plug. Right, okay. You know, <laughs> you know your role. do a job, you know. <laughs> so I'm not going to go walking in there and say, the Daleks would never do this. This is ridiculous. And, you know, it's a, that, that would make me a uh, grade A arse. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have lasted as long as I've lasted now. I mean, I'm probably still an irritation to them because I'm so into the Daleks. But, um, <laughs> no, so I, I th- the, the nearest I'd come to suggesting a change was in the one where there were Daleks and Cybermen battling. When I get given the scripts, quite often they don't have the titles on, so the titles of them never stick for the new ones for me. It was was the one that ended with Doomsday, so what was something of Ghosts? Uh, Army Army of Ghosts, that's right. Uh, So it was in that when the Daleks came out of the Void ship, and there was a bit when they came out, and the Dalek had quite a long line, and I said, well, surely this is one Dalek talking to another one. He seems to be answering himself. So I said to the director, Graham Harper, I said, can we cut the line in the middle, have the black one say this and turn to the other one and the other one can say the other bits of the line. And he said, a brilliant idea, but we had to get special permission to change it, actually. Um, but, uh, but that's the nearest I've come to sort of changing anything. And I think it worked. I mean, to me, I can't think how it would have worked with the Dalek sort of just talking to itself. All right. Thank you. Uh, We're going to head to commercial. We'll be back in 60 seconds, guys. If you've got any more questions for um, Nicholas, then do use exclamation mark question and we will put some to him in the second half of the show. We'll see you guys in 60. Let's go back live. Well, greetings, guys. We are back. Um, right, we are still here with the lovely and beautiful and talented um, Nicholas Briggs, oh. who should be appearing up on your screen now, although everything appears to have changed. Why has everything <laughs> changed? What is going on? Uh, Let me fix this. There we are. Where am I? You are right there. Like and somehow, somehow, go changing my settings. Everything has changed and changed back again. I will fix this. I will fix this as we talk. But here we all are. Um, okay, so so <laughs> they, there we there there we That's all are. Um, so so we we've got one of your 
uh, lovely um, Big Finish companions um, in the Doctor Who Legacy game, which I'm going to bring up on the screen um, in a second. Um, Nicholas, would you mind telling us a bit about her history? I believe she's travelled with two Doctors, is that right? Or am I getting that confused? No, you're completely right. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, she started off with the, uh, the Eighth Doctor um, in... Um, and here she is in one of the CDs here. I don't know what you can see. Hold on. Of course, I'm looking at a delayed feed, so I can't tell. Because <laughs> well, yeah. I think I, I can, I can slightly hear myself yeah. coming back through. Have you I'm still got the... I'm to Skype. I'm fine. Uh, yeah, so um, she's, she was born in 1912, an Edwardian adventuress. She yet uh, 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 apparently died in the R101 crash. And she proved a ma massively popular companion. Uh, when she was the Eighth Doctor, uh, and the TV series wasn't back then, and uh, it's it's hard to uh, uh, really remember. But she, um, India Fisher, who plays uh, Charlie Pollard, she would go to conventions, and there would be queues right out down the hall and round the corner for her autograph. And <laughs> Russell T. Davis, Russell T. Davis said of. Charlie, he, he said to uh, India herself, actually, there would never have been a rose without Charlie because what um, Gary Russell and Alan Barnes did with the character of Charlie, well, and me as well, because I wrote for her too, you know, it, it laid the groundwork. It made it possible in Doctor Who fans' minds for there to be a more emotionally real companion. And really, it sort of set the template for the way new series companions went. Um, and then, you know, after she'd had all sorts of harrowing adventures with the Eighth Doctor, we kind of felt that the journey with the Eighth Doctor was over. And we did this thing where um, she thought that the Doctor had died and she thought it was all over. And then she, she calls for help in some way. I won't spoil everything. And a TARDIS appears and she thinks, oh, goodness, thank you. She walks in and it's the Sixth Doctor. So we did a whole series of adventures with her, with the Sixth Doctor. Now, of course, if you don't, if you haven't heard these stories, you'll be thinking, "But how could she do that without the Eighth Doctor first knowing her when he first met her?" Because he met her as the Sixth Doctor. So we had so much fun with interesting storylines that built up to that moment. I'll say no mm. more. So she had a, a fascinating time, um, and we've also now spun her off into her own. A series, as as I mentioned before, with without the doctors, and we're having great fun with that. And and uh, I'm right in the second series. Brilliant character there. So I've got her uh, character artwork up oh. on the screen here. Charlotte Elspeth Pollard, race human origin, Hampshire. Um, first episode, storm warning, big finish. Um, I'm 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 echoing slightly in someone's audio. So I've got three people on there. I think one of you must have the stream coming back through um, the audio. So you, if you could all just check um, your your um, if you so someone try and mute that, please. But here's your notable associates: Eighth Doctor, Sixth Doctor, Fourth Doctor, Leela, Chris, Romana, Brigadier, Lethbrick, Stewart, and K9. So you got with the Fourth Doctor as well, or was that yeah. a, a one-off? Yeah, what, that what was, was that in uh, the light at the end, our uh, 50th anniversary special. And uh, yes, she got separated from the Eighth Doctor and ran back to the TARDIS. Opened the TARDIS, something weird happened, and suddenly she finds herself in the fourth Doctor's version of the TARDIS with Leela there. And so for a while, <laughs> she travels with them before she meets up with the Eighth Doctor. And the fourth Doctor and the Eighth Doctor and Leela and Charlie work together to help solve the mystery while the fifth and sixth and the first, second and third Doctors are all uh, battling away as well. If you've not heard that Light at the End, our 50th anniversary special, go to bigfinish.com immediately. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll put the link on in this into the stream. Um, Susan, w w while I'm on the um, uh, my my characters here, I've got a character here called Cinder, who I believe you wish to talk about a little bit. Uh, Cinder's going to be coming later in the week. Yeah, um, you know, this is part of um, you know we're selectively doing some um, extended universe uh, things. Obviously, Big Finish is a massive uh, piece of that with with Charlie Pollard coming tomorrow. Um, George Mann wrote the Engines of War uh, novel, and he and and Paul Hanley actually reached out to us and said that. that they loved the game and they wanted to get uh, Cinder into the game, who's the War Doctor's companion in that in that novel. And so that's going to be coming on uh, on Friday, and then on Sunday a costume for Cinder. So so this is like big extended universe week for us. She's a fantastic oh. character, you know. I yeah. mean, you, you read the novel. I, I I read it aloud in front of a microphone <laughs> for BBC. Oh, oh fantastic! So uh, you know. Wow. 
I can't give too much away, but um, there were certain points in that novel. I wrote to George about it, who I know through Big Finish stuff, mm. uh, and just said, you got me. You know, I, um, <laughs> I, I literally had to stop and cry at one point. Wow. I literally, you know, because you throw yourself into these things and yeah. there's such an emotional reality to that character. And she, you know, it's, it's quite a harrowing story, Engines of War. And uh, it really, it really did choke me up, actually. Yeah. Well, you, you've, you've both been in the, in the sort of really cool, enviable situation of getting to expand on characters that, you know, feel like they weren't touched on quite enough yet between the War Doctor and the Eighth Doctor. So uh, that's quite cool. And George yeah. Mance actually written um, the script for uh, Cinder entering the game. He's actually written it for us. He's been quite obsessively playing the game, which is quite cool. And he, he volunteered to actually write the, uh, the storyline for that. So that's quite cool, too. Well, in my experience, you can't stop George Mann writing. Yeah, I get that sense, yeah. <laughs> um, so do you... Um, obviously, you do Doctor Who, and you, you've, you've mentioned Sherlock, you've mentioned this kind of ter Terry Pratchett. You know, where, where, um, someone asked um, on, on Twitter, uh, uh, what other voices for characters have you done outside Doctor Who? Where else can we find a bit of Nick? <laughs> Most of Nick is in the Doctor Who world. I can't think of uh, <laughs> other things I've done vocally, which people keep telling me is mad and I should be doing lots of other voices. But my Doctor Who work t takes up so much of my time. You know, I've got an acting agent and uh, I'm, I'm available. Um, uh, <laughs> for, for acting or just generally? <laughs> <laughs> i just turn up to your house with a ring modulator. Uh, you know, and I've, I've done TV work and uh, one of my great passions is theatre. And, uh, you know, I've played Sherlock Holmes on stage quite a bit you know i've i've played i've been heathcliff i've been um uh yeah i know can you believe it i had a wig on it was a few years ago. <laughs> yeah i was gonna, I was gonna say long long flow yeah, yeah. i think you've got the same issue years. same issue yeah. i have <laughs> <laughs> i was watched, um, but you're, watched you're, you're, you're not just I've the been, daleks and the... i've been you know various inspectors various murderers and uh, loads of theater stuff i do and hopefully this coming year i'm going to be doing sherlock holmes again in holmes and the ripper Oh. And um, I have to say, uh, although doing the Daleks and Submen is very, very exciting, but I, I, I noticed earlier that you also do the voices of, is it the Jadun? Is also yes, you? that is me. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one because I don't need any technical assistance. <laughs> <laughs> but sure, sure, every time you kind of like, you did like a moto, loto, fofo, -fo toe into a microphone, you must have wanted to just laugh out loud, surely. <laughs> uh, yeah, the story about that is I went to the set well, here's the story. Have you got time for a story? Oh, we love Once a story. Once upon a time, my, my old agent, who now sadly passed away, but anyway, he, uh, he phones me. Uh, he was a very eccentric character. And he said, uh, listen, darling, uh, they want you to go to uh, Doctor Who on Monday uh, to be the... Uh, he sounds like the cab driver, actually, doesn't he? That's one of my two voices. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They want you to be a Jadoon captain. And I said, well, what's one of those? He said, well, you're a Doctor Who fan. You tell me. I said, well, I don't know. It's obviously something new. He said, well, I don't know. They just want you to do it. I said, well, I don't know what it is. Said, oh, look, never mind. I'll phone David Tennant. So I phoned David Tennant. I thought, go to the top, you know. Yeah. And, uh, I said, David, I'm coming on Monday. And he said, are oh, you what for? I said, well, apparently I'm the voice of the Jadoon captain. He said, oh, brilliant. I'm so glad about that. I said, why? He said, well, he said, in the read through, everything went a bit dead when the Jadoon spoke with just someone yeah. reading in. And they said, why don't we get someone, to, you know, and they said, let's get Nick, Nick, bring Nick in. We need, a, we need a voice. And I said, well, what are they? And he said, well, they're sort of rhinoceroses. So he told me all about the Jadoon. I said, oh, right. Oh, God. Okay. So I didn't see the script. At, at, at what point were you offended when they, when they realized that they brought you in to play a rhinoceros? <laughs> oh, rhinoceros character. We need Nick. I think it's more more like silly voice we need Nick. So then oh, okay, I right said, oh, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I met the director, Charlie Palmer, um, the, the son of Jeffrey Palmer, you know, the actor who was in Voyage of the Damned, wasn't he? That episode, maybe the captain. Um, and uh, I went to uh, see, you've all spotted that. Uh, and I, I, I went along to see the Jadoon head being put on on Paul Casey, you know, did a lot of the hero monsters, still does, <laughs> I think. And uh, suffers immensely under there i mean particularly in the jadoon mask terrible time he keeps saying no no don't take me out i'm fine and when they took him out of it at one point i mean really he looked near to death anyway um so as they were putting the thing 
on his head. I just stood in front of it and went, <laughs> made lots of silly noises. I thought, that's it. And I went yeah. back to Charlie Palmer and I said, to, I'm thinking of kind of doing it like this, cold football. And he went, <laughs> that's hilarious. We'll do that. <laughs> I said, oh, is you sure? I said, I can do something else. I could do not, I could do a bit high voice, baby. But I mean, he said, no, it makes me laugh. I like it. It, it suits them because it gives them this kind of wonderful, it doesn't make them dumb, but it kind of shows a slight kind of lack of intelligence, but just amazing power and brute force and behind them. And you wouldn't mind it. <laughs> yes. Single minded. <laughs> I stood, I used to stand for that. I used to stand right, but like the camera was here and uh, I, I, I would be right by the lens with the microphone doing it and the puppeteer would be right next to me, almost following my lip movement. <laughs> so I think there was like a, a few seconds delay and now I think in post-production they just nudged my voice along to fit the, the movements. Brilliant. I remember the puppeteer, I, can't, I think his name was Gustav. And he used to do a fantastic um, Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether it was on purpose, though. <laughs> now, uh, we obviously, uh, one of the biggest um, places that people can buy games, books, and everything these days is the, the Humble Bundle. And you can give to charity and feel generally you know, good about yourselves and get some fantastic deals on everything from uh, um, the, the, la the latest games to, to older collections and... Nicholas and Susan, I believe something a little bit Doctor Who related as well. Would you like to tell us about that? Yes, it's on the uh, December the 24th, which is a significant... <gasps> Merry, Merry yes. Christmas. Oh, oh, oh. Um, and we're, we're offering uh, up uh, a bundle, a humble bundle, uh, of uh, Big Finish stories. And you know how it works. You know, you can, you can um, pay what you want, plus charity, you know, donation. Yes. And, and you work out, you know, how much of... Of which, and where um, there's Dalek Empire. Oh, I better, shall I show you Dalek Empire? Dalek Empire, uh, which is a series all about the Daleks <laughs> invading and exterminating. No doctor in it, you know, they're fighting <laughs> new characters. One of these characters you might, I don't know whether you might recognize from that photo. You see there, played by a young chap called David Tennant before, ah. before <gasps> he was Doctor Who. Oh, yeah. Um, so a whole load of those. I mean, there's uh, four series of Dalek Empire, and then there's another series called Doctor Who: The Lost Stories, um, where uh, they're, they're scripts that were written or ideas that were written uh, or just storylines that were going to be made for television, but but ended up not being. So there's the Nightmare Fair, which is the the, the Colin Baker and Celestial Toy Maker one, and there's uh, Mission to Magnus, which is Sill, you know, the Sixth Doctor. Uh, a monster. I can't do the voice. Uh, and, and the ice warriors. That's me as the ice warriors in it. So there's a load of that. And also there's a song of the Megaptra, which was like the original space whale story that was going to be done all those years ago. And also the Doctor Who stage plays as well. You know, there were three Doctor Who stage plays. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. Oh, Curse did. of the Daleks, which didn't feature the Doctor, but funnily enough, featured the Daleks. Um, Seven Keys to Doomsday, which was performed in London just around about the time uh, that the, the third Doctor, John Pertwee, was leaving. And they, so they cast uh, Trevor Martin, a great Shakespearean actor, as the Doctor. Uh, they actually did a sort of sequence on the screen where you saw John Pertwee regenerate into him because no one knew who the next Doctor was going to be. Um, and then um, The Ultimate Adventure, which was done on stage with John Pertwee and Colin Baker. So... Um, we did it with Colin Baker, and we also got Trevor Martin back to be in uh, Seven Keys to Doomsday. So audio, audio versions of those as well. Sounds like a brilliant place for people to start if they want yeah, to check I out some Yeah, I think they are great stories, actually. Big and, stuff. you know, the Dalek Empire stuff, he said immodestly, because I wrote and directed it and did the sound design and music as well. Um, that was before I was executive producer. I have more time on my hands. That we, we got some of our greatest reviews for those. You know, they were very much loved by our audience. So really worth checking out. But for more traditional Doctor Who stuff, the lost stories, you know, they really have the vibe of the TV series. Yeah. And so that's so that, guys. That's um, if you're not aware, of course, that's humblebundle.com, um, as well, of course, Big Finish. And it runs and until the about. 7th of January. And, um, so you can get it any time in that and week. Like, and Susan, is there well, yeah, Doctor Who so, stuff you know, in there as well? We've already done one of these with Humble Bundle before. They offered the IDW comic books um, before the rights switched over to Titan. Um, and we, we obviously are very involved with the Titan guys now. Um, but Humble Bundle reached out to us because it was so successful last time. 
And um, so we're going to be doing a promo code that will give you, I believe it's the sixth doctor, the eighth doctor, um, and, uh, and, and Charlie as well, of course. So we're still sort of finishing up the details on that. But, yes, there will be a code in there as well. Brilliant. And speaking of promo code, Susan, we yeah. have 500, 589 very excited people here that wondered if you have anything a little bit today. Do I do have today. <gasps> What have you got? What have you got? Right what have you got? Well, yeah, it's for the early access, the first access anywhere globally to Charlie Pollard at long last. Apart from me. Uh, yes, <laughs> apart from you. <laughs> I'm better than you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that into Skype for you. Of course, if you paste that across to me and I shall put it up on the screen, guys. So that means you'll be getting uh, our little, the lovely little character you can see right on the screen there. Lovely artwork and lovely character. Can I give you my, so my usual mom screen. cautions, guys? Don't share this. This is specifically because you're awesome. And if you're like in America, you're in the middle of your workday uh, or in the evening in the UK. And uh, so don't share it. This is just for you. It expires tomorrow. So don't delay. Don't dawdle. Enter your code. Okay. So obviously, P, is it your turn to do the number wrap or is it, or is it Susan? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think instead Nick should do it in like a Jadoon voice for us. But, you know. oh. <laughs> oh, that would be amazing. Would you? I mean, would you? Nick? I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, I have to read that out. <laughs> if, you, well, if, uh, if, if, if you wouldn't hate us afterwards, then yes, please. <laughs> it's a long number, isn't it? Stop moving it around. Okay. Four eight seven seven four four two six nine two six five five eight two seven. And then you simply must get it now. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> so get that into your game as soon as possible, people. And please, please, please don't tweet it out. Don't Facebook it out. This is for just for you, just the people that are currently watching this um, live. Dr. Who Legacy um, Spectacular. Yeah. Now, now I'm going to have to get exactly. to the game. I've been, we've been working on that. I think it's coming yeah. in time before. Did you do it? I was gonna gonna say. I mean, that, that, I I I would love a team of Jadun. Um, I mean, can we can we please call them like Hojo, Domo, and <laughs> that's you know, true. Jadun oh, does have like teams <laughs> written all over it, like the Adipos and the Silence. We could actually have a team of Jadun's. Hell yeah, that would be good. Yeah, what the, what's that the would be cool. Jadun, just Jadun. What would their ability be? Stomping around, stomp or something like that. It would have to be like a big Arresting. AE damage sort of thing. <laughs> well, and yeah, test as well, because uh, uh, the, when they originally appeared, they were testing people to see oh, whether they were oh, the right. Category yeah. human, yes. <laughs> <laughs> With the felt tip pen thing, yes. <laughs> Um, a few of the questions, uh, just to, just as we round up, come towards the end of our show, um, a few of the questions we've had today, um, Nick, have been about getting yet more big Finnish characters into Doctor Who yes. Legacy. And, and obviously, Susan, this is to you as well. Is this the, the beginning of a beautiful friendship? Well, yeah. Is this the beginning of a beautiful friendship? Will there be yet more yes. characters coming on? Coming yes, on? absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> we, you know, now that we're going to get past the season eight and the holidays and stuff, which have completely bogged down everything, this has been a long time in the coming um, with Big Finish. Um, we're going to start getting into, into what's next. Actually, I'm curious, Dixon, who would you love to see next? Like, like what would excite you most? Um, oh, uh, Lucy Miller. Yes, I, I've heard that a lot, actually. Yeah, that would be a good idea, I think. And she was, you know, the next... Uh, Eighth Doctor companion, and the uh, dark eyes costume for for McGann, I've heard a lot of as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. the the leather jacket. Yeah, yeah, that was. You all... don't you don't know since Lee isn't here on our on our call that he is like the most hardcore Eighth Doctor fan you could possibly imagine. So he's <laughs> all over, and I mean the the eighth of the month was actually called Eighth Doctor is awesome. So <laughs> that's all you need to know. <laughs> We, we also had some requests for original Big Finish villains, Eminence, Virians, if I'm pronouncing no, it's that correctly, and The Forge. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, it's oh, terrible no. spelling, you know. It's taken, because I created them when I was 14, uh, so I took the spelling from there, yeah. Virans, just, Virians would, is the most logical pronunciation, but no, vi Virans, yeah, great. Do the, um, the, the, the actors that obviously get to replay their Doctor Who you know, uh, parts you know, many years on. Do they, do they really enjoy that ability to kind of go back and revisit their characters? And you know, are, are they as kind of into it as you got as as you? Well, are? they're not as into it as me because you know that would <laughs> that wouldn't be healthy for them. But uh, <laughs> no, they do love it actually. They really do. And uh, once they've you know cottoned on to it, um, you know, some some of them have returned with trepidation, and others. Uh, this is not just. The, I'm not talking about the doctors. I mean, they pretty much embraced us from the word go, certainly uh, Peter, mm. Sylvester and uh, Colin. But uh, it took a while for us to convince Tom Baker, for example. And now, yes. it, it, you know, he's so enthusiastic and so loves it, you know. 
Um, no, I think they realise they come to. I think they they come to love the series all over again, and and it's less it's less stressful doing audio. You know, it's quicker. You don't have to learn it. You're not under lights and makeup. You know, and it's all about imagination, um, inspiring uh, the imagination in the audience. You know, and the audience take do, it further. Do you often, do you often manage to get them? all kind of in together and kind of all act it out, you know, as, as a group, or do you kind of record one story. set of lines and that's it lines? Yeah, mm -hmm. that is mostly what we do. By far, that is the norm. Uh, very occasionally, people are recorded separately, usually for scheduling reasons. But, you know, it's, yeah. uh, of course, Pixar have been doing it for years. None of their actors work together. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and you can never tell. And there have been, there were a couple of occasions where Sheridan Smith playing Lucy Miller didn't work with Paul simply because, the both of them were in so much demand, and uh, you know it would turn out that we would record the main cast with Paul, and I, we'd either employ another actress, or sometimes I would read in Lucy Miller, which uh, uh, Paul McGann <laughs> would say. It's, can you can it, you do her voice? A, well, I I used to just do it like a you know a northern girl, like that. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. and Paul used to say with some humour, uh, "It's as if she's in the room, Nick." <laughs> but then we get Sheridan in I mean there was one point where Sheridan was so busy that she literally had to be biked to us like a parcel you know and she would arrive on the back of a bike with some big hairy biker you know and she'd quickly get off the, the, into the studio into a booth for 45 minutes there's me there playing all the characters and you could never tell in fact our script editor heard one particular episode and he said the way those two work together is fantastic and I said yeah they weren't in the same space at the same time. But mostly, <laughs> mostly they do all work together because, you know, that's the best way to do it. And we have, you know, fun in the green rooms, a real community. And you may have heard tell of the legendary, well, they're not legendary because they're real, big Finnish lunches, you know, our um, studio. But you'll, you'll have to invite yeah. us. I mean, yes, I will have to show us. Let's go to one of those. <laughs> on this program, I have to invite you. Yes. Um, <laughs> Luke Robinson, who is our sound recordist and owns the studio we mostly use, um, he uh, he is a fantastic cook. And quite some years ago, he insisted on cooking the lunch for us. He's amazing, an amazing man. Wow. Feeds us all very well. <laughs> so for all of you um, guys watching, uh, if you'd like to follow Nicholas, he has a Twitter account at Briggs Nicholas with very, very regular updates. You have, of course, BigFinish.com where you can check out the audio adventures. And, of course, www.humblebundle, which is coming out on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, where you can give to charity and get your Doctor Who, well, Dalek um, fix as well. Um, thank you so, so, so much for joining us this evening. It has been an absolute... Um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this for free. When, when you hang up, everyone in the chat is going to go... Oh my <laughs> <laughs> thank you that's very nice of you to say that <laughs> thank you so much and, uh, thank you very much we really appreciate <laughs> thank it. you well, I, I'm, I'm auditioning um and i'm, I'm sure um, guys if guys in the chat if you could pass your thanks to thanks to nicholas as well i'm sure you it'll be flooded in a second with with thank yous um it has it, been great um susan and pete have you got any other final questions or things you'd like to well, say to i mean uh, oh, obviously sure. nick is, is here today and i'm hoping he will return uh in the